Hey everyone, welcome to uh, week six, day one. Uh, so this is the start of a new week and we have a new theme. Uh, last week we did, you know, crazy cool paintings, five very different paintings. Let's hope that this week we're also going to do the same. So for this week, the theme is keys, um, as in value keys. So we're going to explore, uh, you know, what type of paintings we can do if we you know, kind of condition ourselves and put ourselves in very specific areas of the value scale. So uh, I think it's a very, very cool exercise and I think we can produce like really, really cool paintings. So let's see how we do today. Okay, here we go again, new week, new theme. For this week's theme, I wanted to do something <laughs> a little bit different, a little bit different, something that grows from the very fundamentals of painting but that can produce just a wide variety of paintings. Um, so in essence, it's going to be a simple definition, but when put into practice, it, the universe just opens up. So what we're going to do for this week is actually talk about keying your painting. And what that means is that you're trying to establish where in the value scale you want your painting or areas of your painting to lie in, to, to work in. And that depends entirely up to you. This is the cool part. If you're looking at nature, let's say if we were just like representational painters working from life, we could interpret, you know, lighting conditions and in the end acknowledge that every painting act is one of interpretation. But we have centuries of painting behind us that have taught us that we can pretty much do anything we want with painting. I mean, hopefully it comes from an honest reaction to nature. I think that that's where we know we have a good starting point. But if you are working on a valid exercise, if you do have an intent that you recognize when you look at nature, then you can pretty much do whatever you want. Now, I'm a painter that works, and there are technical reasons for this, but I'll try to explain how I work or, or how I view my own work, which is very, very hard to do. And honestly, I kind of feel dumb by just trying to describe who I am as a painter. But I've kind of discovered who I am as a painter when I see myself against other painters. When I started doing workshops, it was really funny because I met other painters. I've had workshops where painters far better than me take my workshops and I'm like, I don't know, I should be paying you <laughs> for you to be here. But when I see my work alongside theirs, I realize, wow, my work is actually of a lower key, which means that I work with darker values. That's pretty much what it means. The values that I usually use in my paintings are usually uh, a step. They could be two steps darker than somebody who works in a lighter key. Now, if I have to be honest, I can't see the way people that paint in lighter keys see. I can't. I really can't. I've tried and I have to push myself like I'm going to do today with this exercise. But it doesn't come really naturally to me. I think what does come naturally to me is to just dive into this pool of midtones and just absolutely love everything that surrounds me. Every time I see a midtone, I can spot so many changes in hue that are in the same value. It's so, so rich for me that I cannot not paint it. I can't unsee it. So a lot of people that paint in higher keys always tell me, well, just look for unity in light and just have your painting be anchored by unity in light. And by light, they just try to almost summarize the light area of the painting with a lighter value than I would usually block it in with. But again, that to me is, is very, very difficult. There's a terrific painter, American painter that lives in, in the UK, Anastasia Pollard. And she works on a beautiful light key. She brings all her values up. 
And when I put my paintings right next to her, and she, I've painted alongside her, and she's a terrific, terrific painter. If you ever, if you're in the UK, you should totally have her as uh, as an instructor. She's incredible. But when I put my paintings right next to her, my paintings look like mud. They look like colored mud. You know, hers look like airy and fluffy and light, and it's so beautiful. But mine look heavy-handed and butchery and very mid-tone heavy. So for me. Doing exercises like we're going to do this week is incredible. For today, I actually wanted to do a super high key painting with just an accent, a drastic change in value in the upper part, which is going to be the hair and the bun. That's it. That's all there is to this painting. It's just very, very high key, as high as you can. This is probably. You know, if, if you're going from a grayscale value, zero is um, your darkest dark, it's black, and, and value 10 is white. This is probably working within 8.5 to 10, values 8.5 to 10 uh, for lights. Maybe some midtones, tiny, tiny bit of midtones. Uh, since it's uh, based on flash photography, there is going to be this very thin but super important cast shadow on one side of the body, on the left side of the body. And then on the right, there's a tiny hint of the body turning in space. So you can barely see that shoulder and that arm just changing in value, getting a, a little more saturation. And, and that's it. Those are going to be my values. It's very, very hard, very, very hard to paint this way because you have no anchor points. There is nothing that you can say, okay, uh, the forehead turns in this plane, the neck goes up to this plane, and my eye sockets are right here. And this is where I struggled the most with this painting. And it kind of reminded me of two things, and it's always cool if we can contextualize uh, why I had a hard time, which is some, something I always, always do with every single painting I, I paint, not just for these exercises that we're doing for these daily paintings, but for every single painting I've done, while I'm painting, as soon as I'm finished, I always ask myself, okay, what was my intent? Did I get close to my intent? Get close to that goal that I had set for myself when I started painting? If I did, how did I achieve it? How did I think that I was going to achieve it when I first started painting? Did I follow that plan? And did that help me get closer? If I didn't achieve it, why not? What happened? What were the challenges? Why did I lose concentration? What was tough to draw? What was tough to paint? Did I follow my values? Did I respect my proportions? I try to do a checklist and always evaluate my painting to the best of my abilities so that I can spot why it was successful or why I struggled. And in this one, I could tell you that while I was painting, those eyes were so tough to paint. They were so, so tough to paint. First of all, they had to be this perfect value. I mean, they had to be dark enough to be a dark within all that lightness, but the shape of them, the shape of those eyes, and they were like Danny's kind of dreamy eyes. So it wasn't just this you know, very traditional eye that I could have made up and just plop it there. They had like a very specific character and a very specific gesture. But I had to draw them in the perfect place. If they weren't in the perfect place, then it, it just doesn't work. It really doesn't work. The whole painting falls apart. So I immediately, you know, remembered two painters that have blown my mind. One is very obvious. And you can always go back to it. It's a fountain you can always go back to drink from. It's Velázquez. And Velázquez painted one of the Infantas. Uh, and, and that's a small portrait that's at the Met. And it's insane because if you live in New York, you can go check it out just thinking about this. If you go there to visit maybe and you stop in the Met, I know that you're obviously going to look at Juan de Pareja because that's one of the most amazing portraits in, in, in the history of painting. But if you look at this small painting, and it's always hanging, just look at the eyes of the Infanta. They're basically black beads in the middle of the face. And I've tried to do that with some portraits. And when I just put those black, you know, circles in the middle of a face, they look terrible. They look like flat buttons. There's so much contrast between all the uh, values that are surrounding those 
black beads that they just feel so out of place that I could never understand how Velasquez had the sensitivity to to have every every single tone surrounding those eyes just be so perfect that when he pretty much did these dark circles were you know in the perfect place we don't usually speak about Velasquez as a draftsman there there's a few drawings of his not not a few i mean there's there's drawings of his but they're not as common as let's say other uh, baroque painters uh, drawings like uh, Rembrandt's drawings you can find all over the place Rembrandt was one of the best draftsmen in history and you can find Rubens's drawings or Van Dyck's drawings all over the place but that portrait and especially those eyes are a true testament of how amazing a draftsman he was because there's no way you can put those eyes in you know the dark part of the eye in without being an incredible, incredible draftsman. The placement of it has to be absolutely perfect. And when I say that, I always think of this modern day Sheila that works in the comic book industry and in the toy industry, which is Ashley Wood. Ashley started as an illustrator in comic books. I'm not sure, I, I, I didn't look this up, but I remember he did um, Ghost Rider 2099 and he later did Spawn and he did Metal Gear and you know pop bot and a ton of other comic books after that and now he's more into his um toy industry but ashley has to be one of the most incredible draftsmen in contemporary art he is absolutely amazing and one of the things he does is that he draws with a brush you know he literally draws with a brush his, his paintings he uses oil but just his his marks his mark making with the brush it's something akin to when he draws with a marker with a very very big marker it's exactly the same they are essentially drawn marks that he achieves through painting uh, and he does this thing and i've seen some of his paintings that where he you know he'll paint this woman and he'll put these eyes in the perfect place and now again it, it is placement but also and this is the hardest part the smallest detail in the eye the smallest amount of information that we can assess from the eye has to describe almost the entire face which is insane think about it it's like this these this tiny little change in plane in the brow or in the eyelashes or in the top lid or in, in, in the tiny little mark he makes for a top lid has to speak about the whole skull. It's it's crazy. Yes, it is a brushstroke, but it is a brushstroke that speaks about 20 things that are outside of that brushstroke. It's, it's amazing. It's incredible. I don't have uh, Ashley Wood's drawing ability. Not even close. I mean, not even close. But I have to struggle. So I can try to get close to what he does in my own way, of course. But I have to struggle. I really painted those eyes like, ugh, and they bothered me all the time. I was never, ever quite satisfied with how I, I was painting them. And even, you know, I have, to, I have to be totally honest. And when I was done, I made this tiny, tiny little mark, this tiny little suggestion of, of an eye socket. Because I kept looking at the painting. I'm like, no, something's missing. Something's missing. But for me, this was a super, super cool exercise and there's a lot of reasons to try and identify why because it takes me out of my comfort zone of painting you know my midtones that i love 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 so much and it also makes me draw with my brush strokes which is very 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 hard you really feel the weight of your brush stroke when you have to solve a drawing moment with that stroke your brush feels so heavy and, and the brush stroke feels so important when you have to do that. And, you know, I took all my values way up in the value scale. Way, way, way up. Of course, I did leave some accents because I wanted to describe form, but I wanted to see if I could describe form with the least amount of information that I, that I could. And granted, you could probably simplify it way, way more. But this is where I felt somewhat comfortable there are slight changes in hue 
uh, here and there. So her top, Danny's top, is actually a little bit cooler, and then her skin is tiny bit warmer, more orange to one side, more yellow to the other. And I really love the final kind of accent. It, it's like the exclamation point, which is the the hair, the mass of the hair up there, which had to be, you know, this dark. That again, I was trying to be kind of mindful of that Velasquez portrait, trying to remember, okay, this has to be in the in the perfect, perfect spot. And that cast shadow has to be the perfect, perfect value. And the transition of that hair to the forehead has to be the perfect value. If not, this dark is not going to sit in with the rest of the painting. And then how it slowly, very slowly, kind of dissolves, not, not in softness, but in value, you know, up in the bun, because the bun is actually not as dark as, as the, uh, the hair on her head. So it, it, it gets a little bit warmer, and the highlights on that bun were also like very specific drawing marks. Yes, they speak about the volume of that, of that bun. They speak about how the hair is turning as a volume, but they have to be you know, spot on. The, the, the little marks have to be absolutely perfect. So this for me was very challenging in many ways, and I actually felt super happy with how the painting ended up because it made me suffer. It was challenging, but the painting, while I was doing, I was like, oh, this is so cool because I don't usually do paintings like this one. I'm so happy that I can see myself do paintings that don't come naturally. This is the whole point about doing all of these paintings. It is so easy for us to just paint something that we feel comfortable with. It is so easy for when we look at our painting, for the painting to look back at us and to say, yeah, you're good. You're so, so good at doing, you know, X, Y, and Z. But it's tough when you actually tell a painting, okay, I'm going to suffer for a couple of hours and I need you to be kind with me. Kind with me in what sense? In the sense that when I'm done, I need you to try and tell me why it was difficult for me. Try and guide me, show me a way to get better at doing this thing that is hard for me. You know, I'm going to pay attention. I'm going to listen. You know, I'm going to open my eyes. I'm going to perk up my ears. And I need to understand how I can get better at this. That's how a painting helps you. That's how a painting actually becomes a, a learning tool for yourself. So I love doing this uh, for many reasons. That uh, just the restraint that I was able to um, to achieve, the fact that there's accents of value, the darkness of the hair up there against all the lightness of the body. There's also accents of uh, saturation and hue. That little red mark, which is actually a couple of pillows that we have in our bed, those were so, so important. And they kind of come out of nowhere. There's nothing that's preparing you for, for the redness of that pillow. So I was very, very happy with uh with with those choices and uh i'm glad so this is this is the uh start of the uh of this new week that where we're going to push ourselves to work within keys and maybe the whole painting is of a high key or maybe an area a specific area of the painting is of a high key and then suddenly there is uh, you know an accent where you have a ton of contrast and we're going to play a ton with those things, you know, during the week. And it's going to produce very, very different cool paintings. So I hope you enjoyed this one. I'll see you guys tomorrow. Bye.